Escondido Coral Arts will honor the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. They're hosting a celebratory concert with a symphony orchestra, chorus, and soloists on Saturday, July 20th at the Center for the Arts Escondido. The concert will feature composer Stephen Sturck's One Small Step with lyrics by Charles Anthony Silvestri. Get your tickets at artcenter.org. Thanks for joining us on the Voice of San Diego podcast. This is, of course, done in partnership with News Radio 600 Coco. I am Scott Lewis, editor in chief at Voice, joined as always by assistant editor Andrew Keats. Hello. 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 And Sarah Libby, our managing editor and snack connoisseur. Hello. How are you? Great. Are you okay? Doing great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Coming up on the show today 80 square miles of ladybugs. <laughs> <laughs> what? Are in- what? You got it right this time, though. (laughs) They're invading San Diego this week in mayoral candidate messaging, and a historic pension decision is coming. Balboa Park leadership needs something, (laughs) something that it doesn't have right now. It needs leadership. It (laughs) needs leadership. And, uh, yeah, the ladybugs. Yes. Are they going to take over? What do we need to do? They fly at 88,000 feet above the sea level? What's happening? I don't know. It sounds like a adorable apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. They show up and you're like, like your oh, daughter look, would. It's, it's like an apocalypse your daughter would love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that's all we got. But on no one seems very alarmed by it. Maybe it happens all the time. They just this time they saw it on the radar. I don't know. But eighty square miles of of ladybugs flying towards San Diego seems like something we should really be discussing at the highest levels. It does seem that way. All right. Uh, this week in mayoral messaging, the mayor's race, I, I, it's going on. It's happening. It's, it's basically being played out in two forums, three forums, email, Twitter, and fundraising events. Does any part of life happen off of those three platforms? <laughs> I wouldn't know. No, no, no. So first up this week, Todd Gloria tweets. <laughs> Superintendent Tony Thurman is with us. That's uh, State Superintendent of Education, of Schools, no, of uh, Instruction. Yes. One of those. He says, Todd Gloria says, access to good public schools and quality education are critical to creating a great city. I want our kids to be educated here, then stay here and build a bright future here. As mayor, I'll, make, I'll fight to make sure that this is possible. This is obviously something. First of all, I'd like to say I agree have it, wouldn't it be cool if you went around the country and you said, like, I'm from San Diego, and they're like, oh, there's great schools there. Like, that's not even something we can fathom right now. And and it would be great for the city to have good, like, just these excellent schools, right? Like, people say, like, Poway has these great schools, but they, they would never say that about metropolitan San Diego. I agree with candidate Gloria on that. So I, But when you ask them, can I tell you how, how bad I felt for you when I saw this? Why? Oh, I thought this was a specific troll of Scott. Yeah, like I, I feel like you're so tortured by the insistence from city fi- figures to talk about elect uh, uh, education and mayoral candidates in particular. In particular, yeah. And, and remember that, that there's yeah. going to be STEM opportunities yes. on every corner if Barbara Bree is elected. Yeah, like a like a, one of those free libraries, except you go in there and you learn engineering. Yes. <laughs> like Honestly, when I saw his tweet that he got Thurman's endorsement, I was oh, man, and put my phone down. It's just like, poor Scott. And then <laughs> a couple hours later, I saw that you you had engaged him. I was like, oh, that had to happen. <laughs> so, okay, the reason I they, they don't have any role over education, and they never actually demonstrate it. You know, the mayor ran for re-election based on how he was going to make schools great, did nothing for education. Because he can't. Because there's no role. Right. So when you ask them, they usually have th- one of three responses. One, they don't respond. The other the other response is usually something about like the whole child language, about you know poverty, access to libraries, you know transportation, that sort of after thing. After school programs. Right, after school programs. Uh, and then the third is like the Ray Ellis approach, which is like real hard, intense rhetoric about one specific marginal policy issue. 
like <clears throat> term limits. You know what I mean? Like something. Ter- tell me about ter- oh term limits on for the school, the school board, board. Yeah. right? Okay. Like you know, like something that's you know, it's a means to maybe a, 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 a some kind of end in the future. You can I don't know term limits would make better board members, which may make better decisions about... Well, yeah, maybe it's a good policy description, but right. it, it's hardly what parents are going to have in mind when right. you hear them say, like, I'm running for mayor to make schools better. Right. All right. And then the third... Uh, or the, well, so I asked... I would add internships. Often yeah, internships are Yeah, there's a lot of internships yeah. and job, job opportunities. Career pathways. Yes. yes. So I asked I asked him, I said, like you said, I said that, and he said his response to me about what he would do, he says, I like youth master plans. So, okay. (laughs) Youth master plans. It's like a master plan community, except for about youth. Right. (laughs) Uh, You've identified the similarity between the words there. (laughs) I don't know what a youth master plan is. The city could be helpful in tackling disconnected youth or tack, tackling disconnected youth with <laughs> workforce you partnership. You want to tackle the youth. So he's going to tackle the youth with the workforce partnership. So watch out, youth. You're going to get tackled. Uh, and then he's... So obviously the Are workforce... okay? <laughs> the workforce partnership does great work trying to figure out, you know, how to connect all these... There's like 60,000 kids who don't work or go to school uh, in this community and they need to be... They need some help. So, okay, connect them. A lot of connecting. A lot of connecting. And then he was, says he's also intrigued by the San Francisco College Saving Program. Okay. So, well, this seems to me to basically fall into what, you, what you've listed as one of the three things. Yeah. Right? Marginal on the side, like words you don't quite understand. Opportunities at every corner. Synergy. <laughs> but... Does this satisfy your desire? For- no, I want somebody that the, the, the waiting into K-12 education is like jumping into a fire and trying to get like a marshmallow out that fell, you know, and you're burning all over while you're talking about this issue. And it's and nobody wants to do it, but they all want to talk about how great it would be if the marshmallow got out of the fire. That was actually a pretty wow. good analogy. Good job. <laughs> Shut up. I'm, I'm no, very that serious. Was that was really that good. Was actually really they good. all they all want to talk about how great it would be to have great schools here, but nobody wants to like really dig in on the K twelve nightmare that it is to talk about. And because I hate, again they can't. Because it's hard. Yeah. It's well scary. it's hard and also they, they have no Right. Well, or if they want to propose a role like exactly. other cities if have. If you want to say I I think it's time for the mayor to have a role in schools, that's a conversation we could have, but right. it's not. Right. All right, mayoral messaging part two. Barbara Bree has settled on a new rallying cry. She said, community leaders who are hungry for competent managerial experience in the mayor's office are supporting my candidacy. Competent managerial experience is going to be all over the billboards. Late at night, you turn off your TV, you open your windows, and you just hear this low hum, and it grows to a growl. (laughs) What are they crying for? competent managerial experience exactly. see i pictured it as like a family feud situation where it's oh, yeah, like okay. show me so, somebody's at the buzzer and they're show like me looking things back things that <laughs> the public is craving in the mayor's race competent. when the somebody they miss that one and the crowd's like competent managerial competency right <laughs> all right so that's uh that's her new rallying cry um but I was most intrigued by a message that actually came uh, out to supporters of her or potential supporters of Miss Bree's campaign from her husband, Neil Centuria. He's a <clears throat> relatively well-known venture capitalist, entrepreneurial uh, sort in town. He, uh, he wrote to potential supporters, <clears throat> quote, my bride, Miss Barbara Bree, is running for mayor of the city of San Diego in 2020. All right, so let's stop there for a sec. Oof. If I called my wife my bride, I, there might be violence. It's not good. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I couldn't articulate to you what is creepy about that phrase, but it's... it's I just only think of it as something you say like on your wedding day. Yeah, I don't even... I didn't realize it was something that was active after the wedding. I, and it's not is it's, it i don't know if it is well has you ever i mean heard i guess it is have you ever heard a woman say my groom no no 
definitely not. Definitely like, not. I'd, I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> Got a fundraising sure. pitch out there where yeah. somebody <laughs> refers to to their husband as their yeah, groom. Jill, Jill Biden's uh, like, my groom, yes. Joe. <laughs> All right. So anyway, he goes on. He says, I, I have taught entrepreneurship and, quote, rational man behavior at two universities. Stop there. What? I think what he's saying there is like economics, the rational man theory or something where like people make rational decisions in the world of economics. And that's what he's saying he taught or it's just or man just theory. Or you straight read it as I taught <laughs> rational man behavior. <laughs> uh, so so um, Neil is actually pretty well known. Uh, he released last year, I think, a, a web series, uh, a, a new show, kind of like Shark Tank, but with a twist. VCs in a van follows a team of venture capitalists who visit and invest in growing companies. You want to learn about So the if you didn't get the premise there <laughs> the distinction between this <laughs> and Shark Tank is the mode of transportation by which the VC firms reach their potential yeah. investment opportunities. Uh, and it's a van. They're in a van, um, and so see. I remember. So as, can, can we play it again? I want. I want you to hear the part. They are very clear about the two things that you'll see in the show. One is team of visiting capitalists who visit and invest in growing companies. They, they do. And what they're what they're showing you at this time is that the people are sitting in a van going from one place to the other. So, so, Sarah, <laughs> they use the word visits. <laughs> it's, yes, it's true that you go there. <laughs> you have to get there. We're <laughs> all crying. So, uh, you have to Sarah, get there, and we're going to document that part of it, too. <laughs> so, because it's essential. Also, all of this and more on this season of. VCs in a van. If you want <laughs> so, Sarah, I didn't realize this till we were preparing for the show that Sarah wrote about this. Yeah. You did. And what we learned this week, like, <laughs> like three years ago. Yes. Because they were <clears throat> looking for a woman to go in the van with them. That was <laughs> the pitch, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Please, will you ride around in the van with us? Yes. Now, Neil had written a column about how they needed more women in venture capital. And so it was a it was a pretty it was a good column, except it was a little awkward to just say, come along in our van so that we can film you. And apparently from the show, it doesn't look like anyone took them up. Doesn't seem like it. OK. Why is the van the selling point? Why did they arrive at that? Well, if you watch the show, they're in the van talking about the investment. They they talk to the investor the entrepreneur and then they go back to the van to talk and then in the van they decide whether to go back and and give them an offer yeah i i that's great it just seems like all of that could happen like at a boardroom table or something Isn't i don't really <laughs> okay all right all right so it's fun good times guys <laughs> <laughs> that has been this week in mayoral messaging this week in actual news monday is a big day for the city of san diego city hall in 2012 voters in the city of san diego approved proposition b you'll remember this is the initiative that ended pensions for most city employees that were hired after that point not police okay but unions successfully argued all the way to the supreme court that the city illegally placed the measure on the ballot Proposition B, though, is still in the city's books. It's still in the city charter. And so they can't reinstate the pension system. So unions are now pursuing a legal effort to take it out of the city law. And Monday, the city will have to decide whether to join that effort or to keep fighting for Proposition B. I don't think we need to review the legal issue with Proposition B at all. We don't. But I do think we need to we need to establish where they're at. And where they're at is that the court 
Supreme Court said, yes, this was illegally placed, and then sent it down to the Fourth District Court of Appeal and said, you guys decide what the remedy is. And they said, okay, the remedy is that the unions and the city need to get together and hash out how to make it right for all these employees who have been hired since then. And the unions have said, we can't do that. We can have some conversations, but we can't really do that because this law is still on the books. And one of the ways that we might consider making it right for everybody is to give them pensions again. And we can't do that if it's still illegal on the city's books to have pensions. And so thus, we are going through a process called quo raronto, which is it's basically by what right is this law still in the city's books? And so it's another court process, not necessarily a lawsuit. And they need the city to either join that or the city can continue to fight that. And that's the decision that the San Diego City Council meeting in closed session Monday will get to decide. The mayor has already said he's against that. He wants to keep fighting, but he doesn't have a vote in this. The city council will make that decision. Are we all good on that? Does everybody understand that? I think so. Right there with you. Okay, so there's one side. The union side basically says, look, what if we need pensions? And you can't have the benefit of this proposition. You can't, the city can't enjoy the benefit, if you call it that, a benefit, if it was illegally done, <clears throat> that's wrong. It needs to be taken out. The other side, Mayor Faulkner, supporters of the initiative, Carl DeMaio, those folks, they say, yeah, fine, it was illegal, or we agree that the court decided that, but that shouldn't mean that it's uh, been, uh, that it shouldn't be in effect, that all those people's votes are now wasted which uh, yeah right yes that's correct so Uh, go ahead well i just like it seemed we were inevitably going to end up here ever since the supreme court ruling Mm -hmm. that sooner or later we would get to this area and so how do you untangle it and it's not at all clear to me i mean it's like like what happens when the vote of the people runs against a supreme court ruling both both sides seem to have Oh, something that we generally defer to, well, but I don't. But they're incompatible. It's a little complicated, I think, by the fact that the Supreme Court ruled on the process by which it was put on the ballot and not the measure itself. Like with Prop Eight, for example, like that actually what Prop Eight would do is illegal. It wasn't like oh, just the mechanisms that got it there onto the ballot was the problem. Well, so I think they would dispute that because um, their case is that the unions, the unions' case is that you should have sat down and, and negotiated with us with that, and and that you actually chose to pursue this as a way to avoid that negotiation. And that the mayor at the time took the advice of the city attorney, which apparently was explicit that we should go the initiative route precisely to avoid these negotiations. And so it wasn't necessarily that it was just like a technicality. It's like they really did want to avoid those discussions. And so I think that's what it, but it still is kind of a process as opposed to like the merits of them doing something totally illegal as far as benefits for a city employee. And so, yeah, I think that um, I, one of the funny things that's come up, uh, city, former city attorney Jan Goldsmith has been adamant that the city should continue to fight, which is he's the guy who got them into this mess by saying that's the route they should take. So maybe take it with a grain of salt. Uh, so one thing I think it's also important to remind people is that he has a pension. All these people that push this have a pretty significant pension and uh, at least Goldsmith and Mayor uh, Fa- or Sanders from the past, and it's not in danger with how this comes out, right? Yeah, I don't. I mean, it seems like there's a group of people. Well, some folks might di- might dispute this characterization, but it seems like there's a group of people who finds themselves in a difficult, pragmatic situation that they have. They're trying to figure out how to proceed, and there's another group of people who would like them to stand on principle and not handle things in a practical logistical manner right and 
it, I don't. I mean, like if, when you're out of government, you have the benefit of being the one who gets to stand on principle without having to deal with the consequences. It's yeah. very easy to say, no, you need to defend the rights of of these voters who qualified this thing for the ballot and voted for it, uh, while ignoring the well. Then what do we do right now? Question. So a couple of notes on this: both mayoral candidates now think the city should uh, unravel the 2012 proposition. Uh, Barbara Bree had supported it. She was the only one of the two who had. And so uh, that's that's kind of a fascinating dynamic. It does look like the city could have politically the the positioning to join the unions to unravel that, which again leads to a literally unfathomable, uh, com- uh, so, so uh, such a complex series of uh, how you make this right that I don't know how it possibly um, comes out or is resolved, but that is literally something that could be happening, you know, after Monday is, is this, is the march towards that resolution. So it's a little complicated, but the city and city finances and thousands of employees are going to be directly affected by that. All right. Next bit of news. Nearly a decade ago, I remember this, I went to the press conference when they launched the Balboa Park Conservancy. And I remember asking, I said, will this entity have any management authority over Balboa Park? And they said, no, 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 no. And so I, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> what will it do? And they said, well, you know, we're going to try to figure it out. Well, apparently they were going to work to try to make it something that like the Central Park Conservancy would actually oversee the park, you know, and, and be a kind of governing body. Yes, yeah, so to say that more clearly, the city of New York has created an independent entity that has governing authority over Central Park. Yeah, and so this was literally named the same thing to kind of, it seems like, be in place to do that. It never has, though. It never found its footing. Lisa Halverstadt did a great story this week. Okay, and this is coming at an interesting time. The Plaza de Panama project, of course, died this year. There is a new effort to redo another corner of the park inspiration point, but nobody knows who's in charge. And Halverstadt got a lot of just uh, money quotes from people saying... We've got to do something better and better for the park about who's in charge here. Yeah, it seems like they've never reconciled the fact that this conservancy was dreamed up to be a leader and never, you know, achieve that. Like they set out to um, restore the botanical building and that effort has kind of gone nowhere. They haven't raised enough money. It's, a, you know, $10 million at least project. And now there are all these outsiders, once again, um, just saying who's in charge. There's all these disparate groups throughout the park. And despite having a conservancy, it can't really wrangle any of them. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the conservancy was created in recognition of this problem, which is there are all these groups. And anytime you try to do anything, there's a bunch of different opinions about what the best way to proceed is. And the end result is usually nothing. And so they tried to create this group that would solve that problem, but instead of tackling the difficult task of giving it a governing responsibility, they didn't, which meant you didn't solve the problem at all. You just added another group exactly. into this mix of all these other groups. Now there's just now there's just one more. I like that the head of the Conservancy, though, said they're playing the long game. So it's not that, you know, they won't be a leader. It's just it's been eight years and it hasn't happened yet. Eight years is not a short amount of time. It's not. All right, coming up on the other side of the break, I interviewed Encinitas Mayor Catherine Blakespear. And we have to talk about the World Beach Game, Sarah. Beach wrestling. Ugh, we hardly knew ye. You're listening to this podcast probably because you like local investigative reporting. So we at Voice want to let you know that there's another podcast that we think you should check out. It's called Insight. I was getting a text from multiple people saying make her go viral. It was a devastating feeling. I felt like I was lied to. I felt like I was definitely taken advantage of. They... It's from our media partner, NBC7. Insight features their biggest investigations, and they take you behind the scenes of their reporting to help you learn how the story came together. The most recent one you're hearing right now is about a San Diego-based porn company accused of tricking women into having sex on camera. You can check out Insight NBC wherever you get your podcasts. That's the big lie that uh, that they're told, 
And of course, we know that that's not what happens. We are back. I, I feel like this was a big deal that I just didn't see or I, I didn't understand. When was the first time you guys heard about the World Beach Games? I know exactly when the first time was. Thank okay. you for asking. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> it was on Election Day um, 2018. Okay. And we surveyed voters in Lori Zaff's district. Okay. And one of them was adamant that she was voting against Lori Zaff for this reason I had never heard of before, which was that she was a fan of having the World Beach Games here in San Diego. And I thought, what right. a strange reason to vote against someone, but also that's completely perfect. The first I heard about it, I actually feel a bit guilty about this, was like a long time ago, like 2015. Okay. When they first booked it, and I got a tip that I needed to look into it because it was a complete disaster. Okay. Uh, absolute mess. Now, is this... And the, then I kept kind of having it in the back of my mind that I might do that, and I didn't. And seems like, <laughs> and seems seems like, like I should have. Seems like that was a tip. <laughs> yeah. That was a good tip. And we'll do a classic, like, voice, authoritative take on what happened, Yeah. even though we didn't have any idea it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Things. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it, what what was it? It was at Mission Beach October 12th. That's what I know. It was supposed yes. to be. So let me tell you, for not having known this was happening, I've become quite a fan of going through the old marketing materials <laughs> for this event. So here's here's where, one description. Where that does I it found. rank? Uh, like Balboa Park 2014 celebration? Well, here's the thing. It's exactly like it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, that yeah. level. Fantastic. Let's it, go. It, it looks like it came from it. It's like it's it's like the other pages from it. Okay, go. So here is a description of the site that I found on the website. Inside the games dot biz, <laughs> naturally. It's like dot biz, <laughs> right off to a beautiful start, exactly. right from the beginning. Like chef's kiss. Yeah. <laughs> the World Beach Games brings you to the hustle and bustle of the sea with all the fun and frolic of the beach. Yeah. Well, I like fun and frolic. <laughs> I'm in. I'm sold. Okay. That is nonsense. I don't. No, I, what I've does learned that mean? Zero okay, things I'll, about what it is. <laughs> no, no. I will tell the you. The sea and the beach are like these like, these are the wildly opposed things. It's I will not tell like you. the country and the city. The, the sea and the beach. I will tell you. Here's where it comes down. Beach wrestling was one of the 15 sports which would have been included in the first ever Beach World Games. Not World Beach Games. Okay. Beach wrestling. Uh, now, beach wrestling... Sounds uncomfortable. It does. Sounds like you get and I sand don't want to do that. Where you don't want it. But so it's wrestling, but on the beach. So that's what we're talking about here is sports. Yeah, I but think, with sand. I think their pitch was like, let's do beach sports, such as beach volleyball, which is a thing mm -hmm. that exists. Mm -hmm. But also let's do all the other sports as well. Including ones that don't exist, that we're making up right now. Beach karate, for example. <laughs> Beach karate, yeah. That's okay. on the list. Okay, so the big thing was they wrote a press release saying, like, you couldn't get... We're going to need to find a place that could actually come up with the financial resources to make this happen. Basically, they said, you have no companies here that wanted to give us $20 million or whatever to pull this off. Which is a lot of money for a thing that's never happened before and it was supposed to be bring a bunch of like thousands and thousands of people to south mission beach which is not the most accessible place no they had they were already planning this is when a couple months ago i heard this that I knew this was uh, going to be a disaster it was they were planning on people staying all over the city not there and there was going to be this like for both athletes and spectators there was going to be this shuttle system taking them back and forth from south mission beach because south mission beach is so S small and it doesn't really when were have... they going to set all this up this is like october that's know, like a few months really away soon. i'm stressing out about politifest it's like <laughs> like one day <laughs> yeah it's like, i know uh okay well we are <laughs> the... they it, they did a very funny job of totally blaming the city of san diego yeah like like you're complete, like you guys you you're the idiots here our beach wrestling tournament <laughs> is taking its business elsewhere <laughs> <laughs> Here's my interview with Catherine Blakespear, the mayor of Encinitas. 
So Encinitas is 63,000 people, Mm -hmm. and we have been a city for just over 30 years. I come from a family that's been contributing to the Encinitas community for 100 years. So my great-grandparents moved there in the 1920s to grow flowers, and that's the historic industry of that area. And so my, and my family's path is it's interestingly similar in some ways to the growth of the city because my great-grandparents were farmers, and then my grandparents were in construction. So it was the boom, 1950s, post-war time. And then my parents are both attorneys, so they were professionals. And now I, I'm also an attorney, but I work as the mayor. So now I'm in politics. Now, is the, is the mayor's role a full-time job or a part-time? How does that work? Well, it doesn't pay like a full-time right. job, but I do spend most of my time at it. Right. So I still practice. I still have uh, my bar license, but I am increasingly doing less law and more of the politics, especially because I'm in leadership at Sandag, and that actually does take up quite a bit of time. And the mayor is chosen at large at the, at the city level, not uh, by the colleagues. That That's right. So it doesn't rotate. It's, direct, it's directly elected. Mm-hmm. And also... Uh, we recently have districted, so the council members represent districts. There are four districts, and then the mayor is elected at large. Right, and you also sit on Sandag as well. That's right. Okay. So I'm the representative to Sandag, and then also the vice chair at Sandag. Okay. Do you like it? The I mayor, do. The- it's really interesting, and it's it's great to be part of something larger. And Sandag is involved in the thing that's so fundamental to our county, which is our transportation infrastructure and network. And so I really like it. So one of the things we made us want to uh, invite you to this show was we read your email you send out to constituents, I guess, every week or something. And this one was all about the issue at Sandag. And we found that you you wrote it in a about a clear of a way of I've, as I've seen so far. I mean, I've seen a lot of people try to grapple with what's going on at Sandag, and that was a really clearly written piece. What, tell me what you think you were trying to get across more, more than anything with that. What's happening at Sandag, from my perspective, is this reckoning with our future. So what do we want our transportation infrastructure to look like in the next 50 years? And that's a big question, and it's something that that is changing because we've been on a particular path with a particular plan that we've been just modifying around the edges for several cycles. And it's clear that that no longer works and it doesn't work because it it won't meet state law, the, the greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements in state law. And also because there's a hunger from people who live here to have a different way to get around. And so explaining, um, explaining what it is that is happening and how far into the process we are was important to me because part of it is that the plan is not developed. And so we we do see a big opposition campaign from some members of the Sandag board and um, some city councils who are weighing in now. And I think it's really premature because we should let the process work and have a new plan develop that does meet state law, that does provide more transportation options than we currently have, especially when it comes, or particularly when it comes to transit and active transportation like biking and walking. And then and then we weigh in on whether we like that plan or not. But right now, we don't even have a plan to be talking about. Yeah. So one of the things you did in your piece and, and that you know I value a lot around here is you, you step back and try to explain. And one of the things you started with was, well, okay, so every five years, the San Diego Association of Governments, like every community, has to come up with a 40-year transportation plan. And our transportation plan has one big problem, which is that it doesn't comply with the state's mandates for greenhouse gas emissions targets and for vehicle miles target, uh, miles traveled targets. And so what are we going to do about that? And then I think that's one issue, the state's mandates and the targets for greenhouse gas emissions. And the other issue that you grappled with in there is that we are also not seeing as much money come in as was projected for the half cent sales tax that was extended in 2004 for transportation needs. And so those two issues combined mean we have to hit some ambitious targets with less money. (laughs) And so what are we going to do? And I feel like at first the new director of Sandag Hassan Akrata came in and he was so vague about some of these issues that people could kind of see in him whatever they wanted to see, you know, and then and it was kind of exciting for a lot of people and, uh, and he had a lot of support. 
And I feel like the same things happened except for the opposite now where uh, some of some of his plans and comments have emerged and there's a whole bunch of people who see what they don't like in it. And even on both sides, it seems like there's some transit advocates who also see what they don't like, but not, and some of the people you've brought up that have opposition to the transit priorities that he's discussed. And so uh, do you think that it has been very well communicated? Do you think he has communicated as well as you did in your newsletter, for example? Well, I think what you just said is really astute. I, I, I think that's exactly accurate, actually. And the the thing is that Hassan is very much a pro. I mean, he's a head and shoulders, respected, professional transportation engineer, leader. And so now now that he's here and he's proposing things that in many ways, it's it, they are similar to things that they are doing in LA now. So they are funding transit. They have transit that they're building to the airport. It will open in 2021. And and so that experience that he is bringing to San Diego is tried and true from that area. And in some ways, Los Angeles isn't a great model because it's so much bigger and it also has this established car culture even more in many ways than San Diego. San Diego is smaller and able to have a transportation network that would that would feed all different parts of the county in a way that's more compact than I think is even possible in the greater metropolitan LA area. So and nobody sees LA as a model, right? Nobody thinks that that's what, that's what we want to be like when it comes to transportation. But when you look at what's happened in the recent past, their investments and their commitment and the amount of, of transit that they've put in after they ripped out their rail car 100 years ago, you know, it's, um, it's striking. Uh, and so, so I think that, that people are, I think what's really happening when I look at it is there's fear of change. And for, for many people. And then for other people, there's excitement about change because they feel that the status quo is inadequate. And so when, when you look at our transportation system and you see that, that so few people take transit and the people who do are largely transit dependent and anybody who has a choice will choose not to, it's obvious that the transit system we have is not providing a realistic option. And like, for example, in North County in Encinitas, we have a period in the middle of the day where there'll be three hours between a train. And that's not really a reasonable transportation option. Like even for me coming back from a Sandeg board meeting where it may or may not end within a 40 minute period, I don't want to wait around three hours. That's not reasonable. So, so if we have an, we have to invest in not just the infrastructure, but also like buying the new train sets. So $50 million would get us two new train sets. And that is a really important investment, which I hope that we are able to make. So there are a lot of different parts of making the system work better. But, but I think all of us agree, one of the things that strikes me so much when I listen to the people opposed to the plan and the people in favor of the plan and Hassan, is that everybody essentially is saying the same thing, which is we want a complete corridors concept where transportation works in all modes. And I think the people who are standing up and saying, this, we're fearful of you taking our road money away, um, are, are saying, we don't mind adding transit, but we want to make sure we have our roads. And then other people are saying, we want to make sure that we absolutely have a transit option. Right. So, well, we had, um, let's pivot off that for a second. We had Kristen Gaspar come in. Uh, she's from the area and, and is now a member of the board of supervisors. And she said, look, I support, I appreciate Hassan coming to the board and saying, we can't do the status quo. Uh, but um, let me read this part. She said, it meant the other plan was completely tossed out and now we have a strategy that's mass transit only. Do I think we needed to go that far? No, no. Now we have about 30% reduction in GHG, which is well over the state mandates that we need to make. So her case is that, you know, this has been a fully transit baked plan. Do you see it as a fully transit baked in plan? Well, absolutely not. And I, I think it's premature to say that because we don't have any data points that would suggest that. The plan is not developed. It's not as if somebody knows the plan and secretly has leaked that to her. I mean, really, literally, the plan is not developed yet. So we're we, we can't say that it's all transit. I think that there's a fear that it would be all transit. But one of the things that's important to remember is that 
that transnet, which was the half-cent sales tax that the voters passed in 2004, its goal is congestion relief. So if you are moving 10% of people off of the roads into transit, you are creating more capacity on those roads. So having congestion relief or and having more capacity for our road system is is something that we all want. And so when we're set, when there's an argument that says this is just going to be about transit, it it really isn't. It's about looking at the whole system. But I think part of what that's based on is some of the more intense comments and clear comments that he made in his first initial weeks here, where he said he just does not support some of the highway concepts, particularly in the East and North County, that were drawn up as part of that sort of idea and plan with the transit half cent sales tax. He's like, look, I wouldn't we can't afford those highway projects and I wouldn't support them even if we could. I mean, he's very direct about that. And I think what they've done is taken those statements and said, well, if he's not going to do those, he doesn't offer any other highway ideas, then he must be doing only transit. And, and he say, well, no, I actually have this complete corridors idea, <clears throat> but then they get him cause he says, well, but I want to expand highways, but I also want to charge for access to them. You know, so he, it's all these sort of, uh, you know, uh, traps that he falls into or that they fall into uh, has he ha, those have been though very clear statements about highway projects can you really say highways will still be part of it when when the leader is saying these highways are not something i would support even if we could afford them so i think that what he's saying is a reflection of what state laws requirements are which Highway expansion projects like to say we're going to add two carpool lanes on long sections of freeway is just not going to be approved. So I think that the plan has to has to be realistic in those ways. I see this as very similar to our housing plans in our city sure. where people say, well, why can't we have low density housing? It's like because that fundamentally does not meet the goal of the housing requirements that the state has. There's mm-hmm. just it has to be a density of R30. It can't be one home per acre, right? And so it's the same thing. If you're going to reduce vehicle miles traveled and GHG, you have to have transit be central in there. But that I don't think that means that there aren't ways to improve the freeways and their capacity, maybe around the interche- intersections, like between the 78 and the 5 or the 15 and the 78. And then something to some type of a way to reconfigure the lanes that creates additional capacity. So that doesn't, it's not always so clear that the only thing that will accomplish those goals are, is the adding of two lanes to additional, like basically wider pavement Mm -hmm. because, and there are lots of things, I mean, we're doing them in our city right now, lots of transportation improvements that, that look at, at how wide does the lane need to be and how can we create more capacity by having an auxiliary section or there are just lots of little things that the carpool the connected vehicle i mean a lot of this stuff is is emerging i don't think it's quite here yet but it it is coming yeah when when we talk about um let's let's transition into this housing discussion so encinitas has been in the forefront of uh, i'd say kind of a, a push back to the targets you described, the the targets the state has set about housing production, uh, that if if you accept that the population is growing, they have to live somewhere, and uh, each city should take a burden of that, should take a portion of that. And Encinitas has had a real harsh reaction to that. They've rejected uh, all kinds of plans that your government has put forward, uh, and I don't think it's your city is fully at odds with the state yet, but it seems to be on the path to that would that would you agree with that statement well no because i think the elected leadership now is unanimously in favor of having a housing plan that's compliant with state law and providing more housing that's needed for our residents Mm -hmm. so i would say that at previous times we were in a much more oppositional position to the state but i wouldn't say we are right now and in many ways I think what's happened is a changing understanding of what state law is and what that means is within our control and what it is that we want as a future. So there has been an education process that says that you can't just build large single family homes 
and think you're providing for all income levels. And if you believe that a robust, healthy community consists of people at all income levels, then you sh need to grapple with the fact that we need to provide housing for everybody. And we don't have very much housing that does that is aimed at people who make less than $50,000 a year. So having smaller units that are affordable by design, that are that those higher density type of developments does provide that kind of housing. And we're never going to be a city that has that exclusively or even predominantly. That's one of the reasons that I've been so in favor of the accessory dwelling units or the granny flats, because we have such incredible capacity for housing in the suburbs. And that is our predominant land use. So adding a few homes here and there scatters the density and allows it to seamlessly integrate into the community. It also is much more palatable for people, I think, because it gives the value to the homeowner instead of to some out of town developer. Because then all of a sudden that person can provide themselves with additional rental income. They can provide home somebody uh, in their family who's coming home from college, who's an older parent, who's a caregiver, all sorts of different flexible living arrangements that I think fa families actually want and need, but we haven't set up the zoning to allow it very easily. And so so for, for a city like ours, we do need to have some more high density housing, but I think accessory dwelling units, granny flats are also a really important solution. There was a, a movement and a discussion at the state uh, Governor Gavin Newsom has proposed the idea of maybe withholding transportation funds for road improvements from cities that don't comply with their uh, planning requirements for adding additional density and, and additional housing supply and, and withholding those funds and as, a, as a kind of reprimand for that. Is that something you guys are thinking about or aware of and, and fighting against? Well, my read on what the governor has been doing is that when he was first elected, he did come out with strategies that were much more punitive. And I think he's softened on those. I think he's had more conversations with communities and realized that there are a lot of them that are trying to do the right thing. And so punishing those communities is maybe not the right strategy. So to me, it seems like he's really shifted in his approach and now there are incentives for communities and there are planning grants and there are opportunities to provide the support that's needed to get a plan because it's actually not cheap or quick to get yourself a new housing plan it's part of your the general plan and it requires consultants and community meetings and technical people and all of that is cost money yeah so so i think that he's really shifted on that one of the big uh, controversial discussions this year was about SB 50. This was the uh, plan that it's, it got to be kind of complicated as it, as it got um, amended and such. But basically it said that in high employment areas and in, um, in transit areas around transit stops, major transit stops, that four or five story apartment buildings or in some single family neighborhoods for plexes should be allowed, not necessarily by right, but a lot easier to build for build, uh, builders to, to accomplish. And so, you know, this was a kind of idea, the, the heart of the idea being that the state, that local areas like Encinitas are never going to have the political will to add supply in the, in the magnitude that it's needed. And thus the state needs to remove that political challenge from them and do it itself. Uh, there's been some mayors that have endorsed that, Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg, a few others who say, like, it's true, I can't politically handle, you know, approving projects like that, so the state should take that out of my hands. Um, but for a, uh, there was one interesting part of the amendment. The, the amendments for the plan took out cities that were below 50,000 people, and Encinitas is right there at 63,000, so it would have been part of this uh, law. And I know there's a lot of people there that were frustrated. What was your take on SB 50 and, and how it, it, it was resolved or sort of put on the shelf? Yeah, SB 50 would have been way too extreme for a city like Encinitas. It was too bad that the cutoff was at 50,000 instead of 70,000 or you know whatever other number. I, th I think that we do need to provide more housing. There are so many different ways to do it and there are there is a lot of controversy about about whether it should be more deed restricted so that you guarantee it's for people who are lower income 
or whether it should just be supply at all levels and how to get to a different housing future. So SB 50 was not something I supported and we as a council did send a letter in opposition. I'm hopeful that the next versions of that won't be quite so extreme. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my position. The Can you explain as succinctly as possible where you're at with the sort of dispute with the state as far as the state is, is telling Encinitas to come up with a plan. You've had a couple plans come up, but then there's also been some voter initiatives that have made it harder to pass those plans. Where are we at exactly right now? Yes. Well, where we are is that we were sued uh, and we finally have a plan. The judge in the lawsuits said that we were prohibited from taking it back to a vote of the people, that the city within a certain timeline needed to adopt a compliant housing plan. So we needed to get the state to say that it was compliant, which we did. And so that plan now has been sent to the Coastal Commission. And once it receives approval at the Coastal Commission, it will go uh, back to HCD, the state, who will say, yes, this is compliant. And then it'll go back to the judge who will say, You've you have fulfilled your responsibilities. So to me, we're out of, this is called the fifth cycle. And then upcoming in 2021 is the sixth housing cycle. So I feel that we were very successful and I feel proud of finally getting us a state compliant housing plan for the first time in our city's history. So it's it's actually a good place to be right now. Is that an admission though that the majority of your voters would have rejected that plan if they had the chance? Well, yes, they did, in yeah. fact. Yeah, but I think that we it's not optional to comply with state law. And in many ways, I think these conversations are so similar, what's happening at Sandag and what's happening in the city around housing, yeah. because we live within a system and it's important that we, that we are realists. There's something to me that seems so absurd about saying, we're gonna get ourselves involved in these lawsuits because we're not complying with the law and we're gonna spend millions of dollars fighting them and it's for what? I mean, mm -hmm. we should be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We should be providing more housing. The amount of housing that we are adding through, through this plan is 6%. 6%. It's not really that much. We're still going to be the same community that's safe, that's vibrant, that's desirable. All the things that residents want, which is all the things that I want and the other elected leaders. So. So we have to find a way to navigate it our way there. Yeah. It's same thing at Sandag. We need to find a plan that complies with state law. I don't think we should get ourselves sued over our climate action plan or failure to meet GHG reduction requirements. Yeah. I have a few things I wanted to go over. Um, so vacation rentals, the representative, the assemblywoman from Encinitas, proposed and has now passed through the assembly a law that in the coastal zone, which doesn't stretch over the entirety of Encinitas at all, but in the coastal zone of Encinitas and, and all through San Diego County, vacation rentals would not be allowed for more than 30 days uh, and would have a significant impact on those. Uh, is that something you support? Well, let me just clarify what okay. her bill says. So Tasha Berner Horvath, she's a former a colleague of mine on the Encinitas City Council, and mm -hmm. I support her, absolutely. So what her bill says is that the platforms can't advertise a place for more than 30 days. So somebody could move among three different platforms, oh. but it's a platform regulation. And then also, if you live on site, you could have a full-time vacation rental. So it's only saying it's for the out-of-town owners that vacation rentals could not be advertised. But if you want to put up your own website that advertises it, you can. It's just that you couldn't use VRBO or HomeAway or whatever the other ones are. So, so we have not taken a position on that as a city. In Encinitas, we do have vacation rentals and we recently have upped our auditing process to make sure that they are paying their hotel tax, which is 10%, that they're registered. And part of being registered is that there's accountability. So if there are noise complaints or that kind of thing, that w that there's a way for people to follow up directly. You have to post a sign. So we're, we are monitoring our vacation rentals and we want to make sure that, that they don't take away from housing. Uh, but we currently do have a regulatory process to be managing that. So that's wh why we didn't take a position on her bill. All right. Um, last question. 
about the there's a race, big race for the control of the county board of supervisors. Uh, Democrats think that they have a chance, and and key to that would be this district that you're in, District Three. Kristen Gaspar, uh, who you've worked with a uh, long time in, in Encinitas, she's the board of supervisors representative for the area. She ran for Congress, has decided. She doesn't want to try that again. She wants to run for re-election. Olga Diaz, city councilwoman from Escondido. Tara Lawson Reamer, uh, an academic and an activist. And uh, firefighter Jeff Griffiths is running. And um, Democrats seem to have a lot of energy, a lot of hope to take that over. Tell me, what do you think of Kristen Gaspar? Are, are you a fan of, of her work and her priorities? Well, I think the most important thing is her policies. So I... I think Kristen's a nice person, and we know each other personally. Of course, we served on the Encinitas City Council together. I was a council member, and she was the mayor. And then her husband ran against me for mayor. Yeah, um, I beat him two to one. Uh, but there's like a family like yeah. ri- rivalry, right? <laughs> <laughs> but and and she's a board member at Sandag. But what I always look to, and I think this is fair, is how do people vote? How do they conduct themselves right. and what are their policies? And I think that we deserve a better supervisor to represent Encinitas and all of that district, District 3. So I'm supporting Olga Diaz for supervisor. She's been on the Escondido City Council for 10 years. And I want somebody who can be really effective, like Nathan Fletcher as a supervisor has been very effective in just his first six months. And that comes from what he brings, his personal skill set, but also his experience in, at the state level um, and his understanding of how to make a change, how to affect the levers of power that are in front of somebody who's sitting in elected office. So to me, it seems like Olga has the same skills. And I want somebody on the Board of Supervisors who cares about, who cares and is willing to work for an Im- improvements in our community that are so fundamental. So homelessness, the migrant situation, our transportation network around the county. I mean, the votes on Sandag, the positioning. I think it's really important to have people who say, what is it that success looks like? What is it that would get us to a plan? And I've been really disappointed with a lot of posturing and bomb throwing, because to me, it seems like it's, it's not we're not going to get move forward unless we're able to say this is important to me what's important to you is there a way that we can find a plan that works for all of us and so i have i haven't seen that from our current super supervisor from Kristen. um and and i've been disappointed by that i'd like her to talk to actually talk to hassan i'd like her to say please come to my office and let's talk about what a how to have a plan come out of Sandag that will meet everybody's needs. And so that that approach, I think, is missing. And then there's also the policy concerns, you know, the the alignment with, with Trump over issues related to migrants at our border. I, 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 ha- I find that to be very divisive and not helpful. Do you suspect that she has decided and her, and her allies have decided that the attack on transit is actually now more politically Um, valuable than any kind of sort of compromise and strategic partnership would be like it's it's actually just okay that is established we can just hit that now real hard and and gain a political advantage have they gone there yet do you think I think that's absolutely what's happening I think it's a lot politics and that concerns me because ultimately the way forward for any group, I mean, whether it's Congress or our Sandag board or our city council, is to, to all sit down and have that honest debate about what's most important to you and let's find that path forward. I think what's happening around transportation in our county in the big picture is really good because it is allowing us to talk about a transportation future that's different in a way that we haven't been able to before. And I know, and I'll just give as a quick example, our previous plan before Hassan came on, I was uh, running one of the community meetings just as a representative from Sandag that where we were promoting the old plan. So it was the previous plan. And there were several members of the audience who stood up and said things that were essentially like, this is so fundamentally disappointing to me because I was hoping that our regional transportation agency would be having vision, would be looking forward to a different future, would not just see the status quo as acceptable and tinkering around the edges. So why aren't you doing 
doing more? That yeah. was the question. And I think I think that we're it, it's never going to be easy to make a change because that's just not the nature of change. So expecting to have this friction around the edges and some interpersonal problems and some politics changes to me that's all part of what this is this is that's part of policy it's part of politics and if you're in this business then you have to accept that captain blake spears she's mayor of encinitas thanks for coming in well thank you so much for having me Thanks for listening to the Voice of San Diego podcast. You can keep up with everything we're doing with our newsletters. We have a lot of them. Get the morning report every morning. And then I put together the politics report every Saturday. And Sarah wraps it up with what we learned this week. That comes out every Sunday. Get all those at voiceofsandiego.org slash newsletters. I'm Scott Lewis, the CEO and editor-in-chief. Andrew Keats is the assistant editor at Voice of San Diego. And Sarah Libby is the managing editor. This show was produced by Nate John, Adriana Heldes, and Megan Wood. We'll talk to you next week.